Hello, hiya, um, Tess, welcome to this final lecture in the A-Star series. I was just about to start recording and speaking to myself, so glad to have someone uh, make it along on this Friday evening. But just to explain, as I don't think um, you're in, I think, um, I don't think you're in yesterday's today. Um, like yesterday, we started going through a calculator past paper um and so today we're going to finish it so the nature of it yesterday um was the easier questions on the paper today's going to be um the more um complicated ones um along the way so i'm just going to share in the chat i'm going to share the link to the paper so that if you wish you can follow along with that of course i'll share each question on the screen i'll copy them in as I go along, and I'm also going to hunt down um, the um, YouTube playlist for this series. Um, so this lecture, as they always are, is being um, recorded. Um, <coughs> so if you want to catch up the first half, you can catch up on the link. This link to tonight, if you want to watch anything back, will also be uploaded to it. And equally, because it um, the lectures are recorded, even though it's just you, I will continue with the normal lecture structure as it's for that. Well, here's someone else as well, actually. Um, welcome to the Thunder as well. Um, so I will continue with the normal lecture structure, but of course, if either of you have got any questions at any point, um, either something you don't understand or any just general questions, please don't hesitate to ask and you can either put it in the chat or it would be equally no problem to um, to put on your mic as we're not a big class. It's not a problem at all if you if you wish to do that to ask something. All right, but we got three questions, one to 17 yesterday. So we are going to start with um, question number 18 on the paper. Um, today and so this question here that allows me to copy it um we've got a question here it's this sign was in a doctor's waiting room and we're told 153 appointments were missed last month these missed appointments were a total of 25.3 hours work out the mean length of the time for each appointment missed and then here's the bit you need to be careful it says give your answer in minutes so it's something it may sound like something really obvious to say but this always catches people out in maths exams but they've got their head in um the metrics they're thinking like there's um between decimals and numbers so they stop um forgetting but there's 60 minutes in an hour so really important to do your calculations taking that into account this was a Three mark question, by the way. So, all I would do here on a question like this is I've got a calculator here, I don't need to overcomplicate things, so I might as well convert everything to minutes straight away. And the way I can do that, well, I've got 25.3 hours, and then I can just simply multiply that um, by 60. So, if we put that into our calculator. It's going to tell us that is 1,518 minutes in total. Now I've done that, which is the mean length of time for each appointment missed. Well, I just need to do 1518 divided by the total amount of um, appointments. Because remember, the mean, um, it's like when you add up all the results and divide by the amount. So we've got the total results here. So if we divide by the total amount of appointments. Welcome Claire as well. Um, we will we will get our answer. So we can just do one, five, one, eight, divided by 115, the total amount of appointments. And it's gonna give us an answer of, um, well, it's, you could put 13.2 minutes 
as as your answer. So 13 point two minutes because I said give your answer in minutes it's fine to do it like that technically it would be as well of course minutes to seconds is also uh, 60 seconds so it would technically be 13 minutes and 12 seconds so as it says just give your answer in minutes we don't need to um, convert that we can leave that as our as our final answer all right so it's always a little bit fiddly questions with minutes and seconds just be really really careful on any of them that um you are converting when necessary by times in by 60 or dividing by 60 we're moving to question number 19 um i was looking at this question just before class actually and it looked like a little bit of a fiddly one but we've got here we've got nima buys a three kilogram gram box of sweets for 17 pounds 60. she puts the sweets into bags to sell each bag contains 150 grams of Sweets. Nima fills as many bags as possible. She will sell each bag for the same price. Nima wants to make a profit of at least 35%. Assuming she sells all the bags, what is the lowest price Nima should charge for each bag? So we've got quite a lot going on in this question. A few different ways you could potentially do it in terms of order. And of course, this is like a classic mid to late question. It's quite a fiddly one compared to some, but it's a five mark question. Often questions like this are really key because they'll involve a lot of skills you know how to do, conversions between grams and kilograms, um, hopefully um, percentage increase, um, dividing amounts by other amounts. These should all be individually doable things, but it's just working out what order to do the question. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to um, a find out how many bags. Out how many bags she fills. And this is what I'm going to need in the question. I'm going to need to find out how many bags she fills. I'm going to need to find out how much money she needs to make. And finally, I need to find out what she needs to charge for a bag to make that money. So separating the question into these three parts is going to make it easier. So we can first say, well, 3 kg equals 3,000 grams. Remember, kilo just means 1,000. That's 1,000 grams in a kilogram and so we can divide that by 150 it's going to give you um 20 unless i'm very much mistaken but we do have a calculator here so we may as well use it so equals 20 bags 20 bags sorry about that little squiggle now we don't have to do anything fiddly here because it goes exactly if it was like 20.2, because it's how many bags you can fill, in this question you'd have to round down. But here there is no rounding, it's exactly 20 bags. All right, so that's our part A done. So now we can go on to our second part of the question, which is find out how much money she needs to make. To make. Well again individually this shouldn't be too bad because we've got we've got an original um, plus the increase. And so we've got 100 percent is always the original plus 35% equals 135%, which means we need to find out if it's a profit of 135, we just need to do 17 pound 60 times 135%. So you can use your percent button on your calculator, which is shift and the left bracket, or you can just make a percent a decimal, by dividing by 100, so it be times 1.35. So again, if we do that, we're going to use our calculator. Um, no need to overcomplicate doing it without. And that gives us equals 23 pounds 
and 76 pence. All right, and so now we've done that, um, all you just need to do, C, which is find out the price per bag. And so we just need to do here, we can do 23.76 divided by 20 which is the amount of bags and we're going to get equals 1.188 and we're dealing with money here some money it has to go to two places so our second decimal place is an eight the number after it is an eight so we round up and so the amount you would have to charge is equals one pound and 19 pence one pound and 19 pence and that's our final answer um verse you can see it's quite a fiddly question that one it's got um a number of stages um you need to um give work out each at a time and work your way through sorry i've never I've never actually done this question before, so just quickly double checking that I got it correct, which I did, I'm pleased to say. But um, yeah, it's all about separating the question out into parts, and then you're going to get to um, the um, correct answer at the end. Just do one part at a time. It can be a little bit overwhelming, questions like that, if you're looking at it all and trying to deal with everything at once. All right, so we'll move on to our next question and our next question we have um a probability tree diagram so i have to copy over part b afterwards but we've got here we're told lorena gets a train at the same time each morning to go to work she gets a train at the same time each evening to come home from work the probability tree shows um, the probability of each train arriving late complete the probability diagram it seems very optimistic for uk trains but um we got here the thing to just remember for part a it should be relatively simple is total probability equals one so at each point we've got three different events we've got the first train we've got the first the second train of the first train is late and the second train of the first train is on time and on each of these individual parts, the probability has to add up to 1. So if it's 0.13 here, it would just be 0.87 because 0.87 plus 0.13 equals 1. If it's 0.06, it's got to be 0.94. And it's the same down here as well. So that's all you've got to do. If you weren't confident with adding up to 1, you do have a calculator, but it should be relatively straightforward because it's just like 13 plus 87 equals 100 well 0 0.13 plus 0 0.87 equals one you're just basically doing doing the same sum here all right and so normally with probability questions as it is here you get two um parts to it the second part sometimes is more um fiddly than the first where you need to understand it a little bit more but it says for a day that lorena goes to work work out the probability that the train to work and the train home will both arrive late now when you've got a probability tree basically you can follow the route this can happen so it's got to be the first train is late and the second train is late there's only one route that this can happen um which means all we've got to do is the probability is the probability of event one times the probability of event two again we don't need to complicate anything here um, because we have got a um, calculator um, and it's actually it, my calculator is making it more complicated i'm going to explain this actually because this could happen on your calculator if you did it you wouldn't have to do it on a calculator but it's telling me um 7.8 times 10 to the minus 3 so my calculator is telling me the answer in standard form and what that means is an ordinary number a decimal point 
would be three places in this direction. So it would be, in other words, 0 0.0, 0 0.078. Okay, 0 0.078. Sorry, it's just me double checking that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. So that will be your final answer. 0 0.0078. You probably still get a mark to be honest if you wrote it as standard form because it's a way to show the answer it's not actually wrong but unless it's specifically asked i would tend to give my answer as an as an ordinary number yeah all right so we'll just move on in um a sec and yeah just, sorry i'm just double checking this as i go they would accept the answer in standard form, just looking at the original mark scheme, if you left it in standard form, if you're not confident of converting, you could just write 7.8 times 10 to the minus three is your answer. And as it is an acceptable form of a number, they would, they would give you the mark still. All right, so next question here, we just got a little bit of algebra to get through, and particularly actually we're dealing with powers here on our first part. So we've just got simplify x3 by x5. Now, ordinary, when you multiply powers, you add them together. But if you've got one power in a bracket and one power outside, you're going to times them. Because effectively what this means is x3 five times. So it's like x3 times x3 times x3 times x3 times x3. Obviously you don't have to write this down, but just to explain why it's not actually different and then you'd add the powers together. So it's as if you multiply these two, so it'd just be x to the power of 15. Next we've got expand and simplify 4x plus 3 plus 7 4 minus 2x. So you've got to be a little bit careful here because you'll see two brackets, but this is not a double brackets question. This is two single brackets which you need to put together. And the reason we know that is that there is the sign, the plus seven between the two brackets. So how I would solve something like this is I just deal with my two brackets separately. And remember, you just multiply what's on the outside of a bracket by what's on the inside. So we've got four times x, which is four x. We've got four times three, which is 12. And then on our other side, we've got seven times four, which is um, here, just to show you the sums we're doing on this end. We've got seven times four, which gives us 28, and it'll be plus 28, because plus and positive mean the same thing. And seven times minus two X, which would be minus 14 X. So we've got four X plus 12, plus 28, minus 14 X, where it's expand and simplify so now we need to put our like terms together. So we've got 4x and minus 14x, which gives us minus 10x. And we've got 12 plus 28, which gives us 40. So we've got minus 10x plus 40. Or you could write it as 40 minus 10x. Either of these way around are, are completely acceptable for, for your answer. You can go with either one of, of the two. All right, and I'm just going to pop in as well here. I'm just going to pop in that is um, a part three for these. I can fit on the same screen or a part of question C, sorry, I should say. Um, and again, this is um, a two mark question. So we've got factorize fully 15 times 15x3 plus 3x2. Right, remember. Factorize means put in brackets, and to put in brackets for the numbers, you want to find the highest common factor as well. Easy enough, three only has two factors. You've got three times one, so we might as well work out three into 15. So here we've got three times five, and that means our highest common factor is the three, and our, our three will go outside the brackets. The other number will go in. 
Next, we've got x cubed. So in other words, it's like x, x, x. And we've got x squared y. So it's like x, x, y. Well, again, what's going to go on the outside is what we have in common. The x squared. And with the remainder stuff inside. So outside of brackets, it would just be 3 x squared because you've got the 3 which is going to represent both of them you've got the x squared i know we've circled four x's but it's two x's in each of them so if you've got something outside the bracket it means it goes into both parts and then we put our remaining parts inside the bracket so here we've got five x because we've used um not two x and not three so five x we've got a plus in the original question so whatever that sign is we just keep and we have got one y remember if you've got one y you don't write the one so just be plus y and that'll be our final answer three x squared five x plus y and if you want to double check a question like that you can always multiply out a bracket again three x squared times five x is going to get 15 x cubed three x squared times y is going to get three x squared y so if we multiply it out we're going to end up back where we started all right so yeah we'll carry on from that in a sec and move on to um question number 22 and question 22 is a topic I don't think I got to on the course. I don't often get to this topic on a course, but it does actually come up. It's a good one to practice. And this is transformations. And so we have with transformations in the exam, the three main types which come up again um, and again, you are going to have three. So I'll write them out here. You get the translation equals shape moves but stays the same size and same way round You've got rotation, so I feel like I'm using the same word in which is just like the shape rotates round. <laughs> round and just feel like it like any shape, say if you have like, I don't know, just calculate and pen together and you rotated it round, it's like you have a wheel and it's on the outside, so the whole thing's gonna go round together like that so it's going to go round by 90 180 or 270 and then um you've got the other one which is reflection traits and i should say rotates round um um a coordinate in the graph so say with my example where it's like going round this midpoint here would be the coordinate where it rotates round so often it would say it rotates round the origin the origin just means zero zero the middle of a graph but it could say rotates round one one and that would be the middle point so reflect the final one, reflection is like a mirror image in a mirror image in a line so again it might be like it says reflects in the y-axis or reflects in the x-axis we could say reflects in x equals one so you'd have to draw a straight line through x equals one and that'd be your your basically your mirror line so they would be the opposites of each other here well in this particular question our shape is exactly the same way round it's the same size so we know straight away this is a translation, 
and how translations work, you write them basically as coordinates with how far it moves in X and how far it moves in right. Well, if it moves to the right, it's positive. If it moves to the left, it's negative. But in here, we've got but maps shape S onto shape T. So we're actually starting with shape S. So what I always do for a shape like this is I will pick the same corner in both shapes because that's how you work out. So you just take our bottom corner here. And you can see to get from S to T, we need to move along one, two, three, four, five squares. You could do this more mathematically if you wanted, but it's fine to do it like this. So we can say negative five because it's gone backwards five squares. Now with a y-axis, if it goes up, it's positive. If it goes down, it's um, negative. So we can say here. We're going up um, by our one, two, three, um, four, five, six squares. So we are going up six. And so normally, actually how you would normally write, I'm writing them side to side just to show it's like coordinates, but really you would write it with the X on top of the Y. So you would write it, it tends to be by minus five, six. And effectively what this is when you've got a movement like this is a vector. So you might see a question with vectors. This is a vector movement, five squares to the left and six squares squares up, so it's minus five and six. All right, um, so I'm going to a little bit of a brief introduction to that, um, but it's a topic yeah, maybe worth maybe worth practicing as well. We're going to pop on to question number 23, and 23 is another thing, it comes up occasionally, it's to do with inequalities. Um, it's something worth practicing because I think when it comes up late in the exam, once you get on top of it, it's actually pretty easy, in my um, opinion. And nothing's that easy, of course, if you don't know the rules, if you haven't practiced it. But once you get on top of it, it doesn't really change no matter what the measurement is. You just have to understand rounding. So we're told a length of a football pitch is 90 meters, correct to the nearest meter. And we need to complete the error interval for the length of the football pitch. Well, what an error interval means is you're always gonna have it the two sides and it gets drawn out for you. So basically on one side, you are gonna have the smallest number but will round up to 90. On the other side, because it's just greater, you have the smallest number which wouldn't round down to 90. And it's always going to be 0.5 on both sides. Because if you think about it, if you rounded 89.5 to the nearest meter, um, to the nearest meter, equals um, 90. But if you rounded, I'll put this down here, 89.4 to the nearest meter, it would equal 89 because you'd round down. If it's a five or high, you round up. If it's a four or low, you round down. It doesn't matter what digits would be after. So therefore, um, the um, smallest number which would round up to 90 to the nearest meter is 89.5. 89.5. So it's like doing rounding in the opposite direction here. Well, now we've got underneath, we want the smallest number which would round, um, which would round up because we've got to say it's less than. So if it was 90.5 to the nearest meter, where it would equal 91. And again, if we did, for example, 90.4 to the nearest meter, 
I don't know why I'm spelling meter two different ways above or below, but we're going to carry on with it. Why not? Um, equals 90. So that doesn't work. That doesn't work. Um, so basically, then, because it's just got is less than, we know that the size is less than 90.5. And what this basically tells us is that this football pitch we don't know the size of, it has to have a size um, which is 89.5 metres or higher, and it has to be less than 90.5 for it to have rounded to 90 metres. All right, so it takes a few, a little bit of practice um, to um, do these ones, but um, I think it's um, a skill you can get on top of reasonably well because even if you don't fully understand it you're always doing 0 0.5 0 0.5 there's always going to be 0 0.5 on both sides because rounding is always to do with 0 0.5 sorry Claire, i just saw your question now i know you don't need to read write a positive on a on a six on this translation and the reason is but it's just like any number if you don't have a sign before a number its default is positive basically positive and plus it's like the same thing but if you've got um a number on its own we don't write the positive sign it's just taken as a given but it's positive we only write the negative sign of it's if it's negative i hope that i hope that makes sense all right so I'll just give a second to copy this and then we will um move on to the next question Okay, so I'll we'll move. Okay, no problem. Um, and so we'll move on to the next question here. Um, so here we got a two-part question. This one as um a one part for question two, and our first part is a four-part question. So again, it's a big question. That's quite a lot going on with it. So we are told um, Festival A will be in a rectangular field with an area of 80,000 metres squared. The greatest number of people allowed to attend. Festival A is 425. Festival B will be in a rectangular field by 700 by 2000. The greatest number of people allowed to attend. Festival B is 6750. The area per person allowed for Festival B is greater than the area. Um, per person allowed for Festival A, how much greater? Give your answer to the nearest whole number. So we want to deal with our two bits separately. So first of all, Festival A. This is relatively straightforward. Um, sorry, I should write a capital. Um, don't worry too much about squared meters because we're going to do the same things measured the same way. So we can just do 80,000 divided by 425 remember you've got your friend calculator here so if you put that in it's going to give us a bit of a horrible fiddly number but equals 188.235 i'm just going to put dot 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 we're giving to the nearest so it's very unlikely festival b is going to be exactly the same well Festival B now we need to deal with. We've got a little bit more to do. B. So we need to, first of all, work out the area meter squared, which is length times width. So area equals 700 times 2,000. It's if you do that. Be very doable without a calculator. You just do 7 times 2 and add the zeros. But um, it will be 14, oh, 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 oh. So it's 14 with the five zeros. And now we need to divide that by 6750, which is the amount of people 
let's say that gives us equals 207.4 we don't need more numbers because the other one was the point two um and we're told festival b is greater than festival a well we're glad to see we got a bigger number for festival a we'd be worried if we didn't but all we got to do now is minus the 188.23 whatever um so we can just do minus 207.4 so I'll keep your answer in your calculator and just do 188. You could just do 188 or 188.2 equals um, um, 19.2. And so if we look at the question, it says give your answer to the nearest whole number. Well, it had in the mark scheme already, it has the form so it would just be 19 meters squared and that'd be your final answer all right i'm just gonna make space down here for our part b okay Sorry, I'm just hunting it down. I've got too many windows open. Okay, so we've got part B here. We are told about a statement. Sometimes you get these questions quite common. One mark part B. We're told Callum says 300 centimetres squared is the same as um, three metres squared because there are 100 centimetres in a metre, so you divide by 100. Callum's method is wrong. Explain why. And the people in exams who give statements like this, they're nearly always wrong. Very rarely they're right. Um, but the reason he is wrong is because his true way says one meter equals a hundred meters. But how you work out squared to squared of a measurement is one meter squared equals a hundred meters squared which means for one to one, one equals um, 10,000 because 100 times 100 gives us um, 10,000. Um, okay, and so you could just write, if you wanted to write it in another way, you could just say, if you just knew, you could say three meters equals 30,000. Three meters squared equals 30,000 cm squared. Or you could just say you need to square it or whatever, but this is the reason why. And it's if you ever have asked to give something in like meters squared or millimeters squared or anything like that, just remember this. Do the original difference between the two. So say, for example, that's 10 millimeters in a centimeter. Well, that means there's a hundred millimeters squared in a centimeter squared because 10 times 10 equals 100 or it would mean that'd be a thousand millimeters cubed in a centimeter cubed because 10 times 10 times 10 equals a thousand so just if you can remember that but you just do the calculation then you don't need to memorize the um conversions for squared or cubed you can just do the sum if it does come up all right so we'll move on now to um question number 25 so we've got here the points l m and n are such that l m n is a straight line we are told the coordinates of l are minus 3 1 the coordinates of m are 4 9 for coordinates uh, find the coordinates of n and we're given that lm to mn equals 2 to 3. So we've got quite a lot going on in this question. I'm, you wouldn't have to do this question with a diagram, but I'm, I'm going to draw out a diagram just to explain. But I apologise, my line will invariably not be straight. We've got L here and we are told it's minus 3 to 1. Next, we've got M over here. And we are told it's 4 to 9. And then we've got 
and somewhere over here. And we know from a ratio perspective, it's three, two to three. So we know this here is two parts, and this here is three parts. So basically, in um, so in ratio terms, we know the gap between L and M is a it is um, two parts um, and the gap between M and N is three parts. So therefore the gap between M between the X coordinates and the Y coordinates from L to M will be two thirds of the size of the gap between M and N. I hope that makes sense. It's quite a fiddly question. I had to explain this to someone who actually came up the other day and I was like, well, this is a little bit of a fiddly one to explain, but hopefully that makes sense. So our gap from, so, so first of all, we want to find um, gap between L and M. So here we've got our X and our Y. So our X is in effect, we've got X of course and Y, X and Y. So X we can say is four minus minus three. Four minus minus three is like four plus three because you've got the two signs in the middle which cancel each other out, so equals seven. And you've got Y, you've got nine minus one, equals eight. And so, basically, we know that this is two parts or two thirds of the gap between um, M and N. So now, what we can just do to find one part is we can divide both numbers by two, so we got here as two parts of our ratio. We divide them by two, we're going to get to one part. And so, so I just got someone arrived, I believe. Um, welcome Rupinda as well. Um, so we've got seven to eight is two parts. We're going to divide those numbers by two. So seven divided by two gives us 3.5, so our new coordinate for x is um, 3.5. Sorry, Rupinda, I'm just going to pop your mic off for now because it's echoing, but if you want to ask anything at any point, if you've got any questions, do feel free. You can either put them in the messages or you can pop your mic on to ask a question. It's not a problem at all. Um, but yeah, so we've got... Uh, the one part, so we've got seven divided by two gives us to 3.5, and we do the same for the y, so we're dealing with both separately. So we've got eight divided by two, which gives us four, and then we want to get to three parts because that's the gap from m to n, so we need two times by three. So 3.5. Um, times by three gives us 10.5 and four times by three gives us 12. So we've got, so this is the difference between um, like um, M and N. So it's like this gap is 10.5 across. If it was on a graph, it'd be 10.5 across um, and 12 up. It would be possible in a question like this as well, I guess, that really helped you visualize it or to do it, to draw it all out on a graph, and then it might 
make more sense if you struggle if you struggle with this it could be something to practice doing afterwards if you think it would be helpful but now we've done that this still isn't our final answer because we need to add these because we have m and then we've got plus the gap equals n so we've got m here for x and y is these coordinates here so we've got four and nine now we need to add the gap between m and n which are these numbers here so we've got 10.5 and 12 and we get to n which is 14.5 and 21 and so that will be our final answer for the coordinates for n is 14.5 and 21 and yeah i don't know if you found that question a little bit challenging or confusing i i taught this question um um to um i taught this question the other day um to someone and it's a challenging question so talk about tests I, I see your question now as i say that it's going to be unfortunately particularly challenging for you sorry it's so not to, yeah sorry it is test yeah um i can see you're struggling with that um as well what i would um probably say um tess is to just work on coordinate questions from the start and then work separately on ratios and this is a combination of the two what i would say to you as well is i wouldn't i wouldn't panic if you don't if you struggle on this question brilliant if you get it go back over it i'm going to um when i put up a youtube recording have a go back over it one stage at a time and see if you understand it but this one i've never seen a question like this on another paper it's a combination of two skills which is a bit random and two it's very hard so i would put it sort of low down on the priority of things i need to learn i would first try and make sure i'm really strong on um on coordinates Secondly, that I'm really strong on ratios and then worry about um, combining the two. But honestly, as I say, I genuinely, I, I taught this question the other day to someone and it's, um, I thought the other day when I was, I was like, this is a bit of a horror question. It's, it's not a nice one at all. Um, normally, I mean, we'll see the next, the next question afterwards, which is complicated because we're at the end of the exam. Of course, all the questions at this stage are level five questions. They're complicated, but you'll see when we give the explanation, it's much simpler. That's an extremely, an extremely challenging question. Um, all right. And so we've got here for question 26, we've got a new phone cost 679 pounds. We've got the value of the phone decreases at a rate of 4% per year and work out the value of a phone at the end of three years. Well, the key word here you can miss is it's going to decrease and so if you start remember when you always start with a percent is 100 percent and so if it decreases by four percent it's going to equal 96 percent so each year it's going to equal 96 percent of the year before and in effect although this is a decrease it's a compound decrease so compound decrease just like compound interest so to work out compound um percentages with a calculator we can put the amount of years as a power so all you would have to do then is effectively the sum you'd be doing is 679 times 0.96 to the power of 3. Oh, sorry, I, I should have put it would equally, it could be 96% to the power of 3. Um, I just tend to naturally change it into a decimal. You could still use your percentage button event to the power of 3 on their calculator. So you do 679 times 0.96 and then if you um look at your um calculator 
Um, so you've got here, you've got the X3 button up here and you just press that. And if you do that, it's going to give you a big old number equals 600.735. Well, again, money is always to two decimal places because we're talking pounds and pints. So our second decimal is a three. The number after it is a five. So we can do 600 pounds and 74 pence. And that's our final answer. All right. And so we've got a couple of um, questions left on this. So hopefully we're going to just get through it in time um, by the end of um, by the end of exactly this session. I should have said that question just then I've just done is a three mark question. The one before the horror show with coordinates was only a four mark question. The um, that one with percentage was a three mark question. Um, so we'll move on now to question. Um, 27 and it can be like this. I think for those tests you weren't here yesterday, but it was quite the first half of the exam Was relatively straightforward, but the second half is quite a challenging second half of the exam if I'm being honest um, It can be like this. some I Would say not every single maths paper is created Equal obviously it depends on what topics you feel comfortable with as well But some are more challenging than others and this is quite a challenging second half of Paper, so don't worry if a few of the questions have been difficult. Hopefully, um, you're understanding the majority, and if you're doing that, you're doing great. Um, so we've got here for 27. We've got in Spain, Sam pays 27 euros for 18 litres of petrol. In Wales, Leo pays 40 pounds and 80 pence for eight gallons of the same type of petrol. One euro equals 0 pound 85. 4.5 litres equals one gallon. Sam thinks that petrol is cheaper in Spain than in Wales. Is Sam correct? You must show how you get to your answer. Well, as I said, normally the people in these questions are wrong, but you need to always work it out. You can't just say Sam's probably wrong because I'm normally wrong in exams. And this, again, it's, it's a little bit fiddly to get your head around because we've got a lot of conversions here. So you want to deal with one thing at a time. So we've got two areas. We've got, we want to make the amount um, first of all, we want to make sure both of these are in um, the same. Um, we want to make sure both of these are in the same measurement. And you could do this. You could convert gallons to liters, or you could convert liters to gallons. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to convert liters two gallons so 18 liters and we know that 4.5 liters equals one gallon so we can say divided by 4.5 equals four gallons and they've nice it's helpful to go in that that way to four gallons it's gone exactly so we can say 27 euros equals four gallons. And well, in Lee, in Wales, Leo's bought eight gallons. So all we've got to do to get to eight gallons is we can now times this by two. So 27 times two, we can say 54 euros equals eight gallons so next we know 54 euros equals eight gallons we know that um 40 pounds 80 equals eight gallons and we know one euro equals 85 pence so now what we can do to turn it to pounds is we times this by 0.5 Eight five, so we can do fifty four times point eight five, and that's going to get us to um, forty five pound. 
and 90 pence equals 8 gallons. Um, eight gallons in Spain because all of these calculations was in Spain um, up here so we know it's 45 90 for eight gallons of pain well if we look at the question um, Leo is paying 40 pound 80 in wheel so um, we can say um, Sam is wrong as I said they're nearly always wrong but you can't just write that you do it actually need to prove it all right so say a question like that is just doing one stage at a time again it's a not a nasty old question because there's a lot of converting to do but don't try and convert two steps at once always do all the conversions and don't try and convert to meet in the middle either i would convert everything from one side to the other so i'd have done this question one of two ways i would have either done what I've done, so start with Sam, convert it to gallons, convert to the same amount of gallons, convert the money, or I would have started with Leo, um, convert it to litres, convert it to the same amount of litres, convert to the money. So you could do it either way round, but I would only convert one person until you get everything fully like the other. If you try and convert both sides to meet in the middle, that's when things start getting really confused. All right, so final question here. I'm going to have to rush it a little bit because of time, so I've got class pretty much straight after this. But we need to solve the simultaneous equation. 5x plus 2y equals 27. 6x plus 4y equals 28. Now, we did do simultaneous equations, I think, all the way back in lecture three. So if you're not getting it right now, don't worry. Go, maybe go back and try and watch that lecture, definitely. If you watch, we've definitely done whole lectures on it on previous series. If you look for playlists on previous series, you can find it. But basically, to solve a simultaneous equation, so we A, make equivalent, um, make equivalent, equation or equations if you need to do both so that one of the unknowns x or y is the same so as long as you multiply both sides of an equation by the same amount the equation still means the same thing then B, you need to deduct one equation from the other. C, solve the first equation um, to find letter 1. Put the value of letter 1 in one of your original equations and solve or the other value. It's a bit of a rushed explanation, but in this case, what we can do, well, basically we need to find a common multiple of either the x's or the y's. And you could do this, it's just like you do this when you're adding um, fractions, you multiply the denominators. In this case, we can, um, we need to make either our x's or our y's the same by finding a common multiple. But 4 is 2 times 2, so we can just multiply our first equation by 2. And if we do that, we need to multiply all parts by 2. So 5x times 2, 2y times 2, and 27 times 2. And now we don't need to do anything to our first equation because we've got 4y here already. Now we've done that, we can just take one to the other. As simultaneous equations go, this hasn't been too nasty with numbers. So we've got 4x here, 4y times, take 4y equals 0, um, 54 take um, 28 equals um, 26, um, does it? yeah it does, 26, um, and so now we need to do 26 divided by 4, which doesn't actually go exactly, you would have a calculator if you fiddle with this, but it equals 6.5 and what that means is 
x equals 6.5. Now we can put that into one of our original equations. So we've got 6x, so we could say 6 times 6.5. It doesn't matter which of the original equations you put it in. Plus 4y equals 28. So I should have done this. I'm going to do this down the bottom so that it's a bit less on top of each other. So now, so we've got 6x plus 4y equals 28. Remember, if you've got a number in a letter, it means that multiplied. So we've got 6 times 6.5 um, plus 4y equals um, 28. This means 39 plus 4y equals 28. And now we've got minus 39 which means 4y equals um, 28 for my negative 11. We've got quite horrible numbers here, actually, they've given us. And then we need to divide by 4, but you would have a calculator if you needed it here. Um, and so y is going to equal, um, well, to negative 2.75. Sorry, that's a little bit rusty at the end. Um, I do need to run up, but as I say, there has been a previous lecture on simultaneous equations where I went through them a little bit um, slower along the way. Hopefully that all um, makes um, makes a bit of sense and yeah, exactly, you can run through it slower at a later date if it, if it helps. And yeah, just checking it that I did get it correct, so all good. All right, brilliant. No, thanks so much, Tess. Um, thanks to Katana. Thanks for sticking with it. Um, that comes to the end of this course, but we start again next week at the same time. So we'll be starting from the start of the course, looking at algebra from next Thursday at 7.15. So brilliant. Have a good night, both of you. Have a great weekend. And good luck if you've got your test coming up. If not, you're more than welcome back next week if you wish. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye.